you're listening to the Prepper Recon Podcast. For questions, comments, and podcast archives, go to PrepperRecon.com. After a massive wave of disappearances, 26-year-old CIA analyst Everett Carroll finally believes what he's been told about the biblical prophecy of the rapture. Global currencies have collapsed, famine and plague have claimed the lives of millions, and the world has crumbled into chaos. Seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials of God's wrath are about to be poured out upon the earth, and woe to the inhabitants thereof. Buy your copy of The Days of Elijah, Book 1, Apocalypse, by best-selling author Mark Goodwin, in paperback or Kindle edition from Amazon.com today. Whether your plan is to bug out or bug in, CampingSurvival.com has all of your preparedness needs, including fish antibiotics, long-term storage food, and water filters. Use coupon code PREPRECON for 5% off your order at CampingSurvival.com. Hey Preppers and Patriots, this is the second half of my interview with John Theo, author of White Mountain's False Flag. Enjoy the show. And once again, to go back to the pastor's dereliction of duty, they're just petrified of getting into politics. But, you know, and we think about politics, and a lot of people, they don't want anything to do with politics. You know, you're like you're talking about, they, they want to talk about the deflated football or whatever else that's going on. Yeah. Uh, but, but, and they, but people think about politics and they think about, they think it's this bantering that's going on right now between uh, Trump and Clinton, and that's not what politics is. Politics is is uh, it's the business of making laws, and when we as Christians are content to sit on the sidelines, we end up with laws that oppose God's plan. Do you think that's accurate? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And we need to be even from the pulpit and the church nurturing. Christians that want to get into politics. For some reason, I, it seems like no one wants, no Christians want to get into politics anymore because it's, it's they see it as being too mud flinging or something. But yeah, we we need to be nurturing more Christians to get into this fight. Yeah, that's a that's a a, a really really good point, and and it is a high ca- calling to get in there, and you know, and you are going to have to roll around in the mud. Uh, with these people, and it's a horrible environment, and I, I can understand that most most people that are really biblical would rather stay away from that environment. But uh, if you don't do it, somebody else is gonna, and and we're gonna end up with with their laws. So, yeah, pretty soon you won't have the choice to get in into it. You won't be allowed to. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and back to the Nazi Germany thing. You know, uh, Jews were completely exiled from from the entire culture slowly systematically over a period of years everybody thinks that you know all oh, one day the jews were free and the next day they were they were herded in the cattle cars and uh, and burned right and that's not how that happened that was a a no. slow progressive thing where uh for the most part it Every step of the way, they were complacent and just kind of went along to get along as a whole. And and I yeah, see us doing exactly the same thing. It's the boiling frog um, syndrome. You know, how do you boil a frog? You do it like one degree at a time. And it, you, before you know it, how did you get to this point? Uh, it's just a, incremental, incremental. But, you know, one night I, I woke up one day and this camera's on top of our streetlight. And then the next day, you oh, you know, this little freedom is taken away, or that's a little nudge here and there. And before you know it, you're living in, you know, an, an Orwellian society. Yeah, you really feel it in, in Massachusetts too, don't you? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. It's, and it killed me. Killed me. This is the land of Lexington Concord. And right. And it, it just – it's heartbreaking for me from a liberty point of view – to know this is the cradle of country started in Massachusetts, and we have so many less freedoms than other states. I mean, this should be like the freest state in the in the union, and it, and it just it's heartbreaking from a liberty point of view. And that we were talking a little bit about, um, you know, folks maybe needing to set aside a portion of their tithe to places like Center for Medical Progress. Um, 
I think that the NRA might be another place that you want to think about dedicating a portion of your tithe to. And I, I realize that the NRA isn't necessarily a Christian organization, but my concern is that once the guns are gone, the church doors will be locked. And in oh. that case, donating to the NRA might be the best thing you could possibly do for your church. What do you think? It, uh, from a constitutional point of view, clearly the Second Amendment protects the First Amendment. If the Second Amendment goes away or they can you know, drastically regulate it, it's only a matter of time before the church doors are locked. Already we're seeing an encroachment on our freedom of speech. You have safe zones and you have all this other stuff you can't even – speak and you i mean uh, uh, employees in the west coast who work for the government can't say the word brown bag and brown bagging it to work because they'll get fired because it's it's just you you the political correctness is insane if if the second amendment goes away that level of insanity will just go through the roof and unfortunately with very few exceptions most pastors don't have the good sense to speak up for the second amendment so um you know, if we don't donate to the to the NRA, if we're not able to to protect the Second Amendment, um, these guys are going to need some uh, some serious uh, vocational training, right? Because they're all going to be out of a job. Yeah, I, I think unfortunately a lot of pastors and, and just citizens have bought into the lies of revisionist history, which we've talked about in our last interview, where they somehow are convinced the Second Amendment was for hunting. And, you know, all, now all the uh, founding fathers were just, you know, deists and uh, slave owners and idiots. And they've just the revisionists have gotten hold of it. And I think that a lot of pastors have bought into that whole Second Amendment is just for hunting <laughs> mentality. You even hear that from from the right a lot, don't you? The, you know, oh, the, the right to for for collectors and hunters and so on or or our home defense. And it has and it really it has nothing to do with. With home defense, it says for the the security no. of a of a free state. Absolutely, I get so upset when people I say that to me because it. I realize I have such a long road ahead of me to unpack that and and explain what it's really about. I'd rather someone approach me and say, "Listen, I know what the Second Amendment's about. I just don't like it." At least they're being honest. I mean. I have to like re-educate people who believe it has to do with hunting. It's just so frustrating that we have just been brainwashed by revisionist history. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. The dollar's lost over 90% of its purchasing power since 1971. Silver, on the other hand, has proven to be a very stable form of wealth preservation over the years. And where do you buy silver? Silver.com, of course. Silver.com offers fantastic prices on gold and silver. Check out Silver.com today. Ready-Made Resources is a trusted name in the Prepper community because they've been around for 18 years. They offer great prices on night vision, water filtration, long-term storage food, solar energy components, and provide free technical service. Get ready for an uncertain future at ReadyMadeResources.com. Do you touch on some of these topics in uh, White Mountain's False Flag? I do, I do. Uh, on the uh, on the surface, um, White Mom's false flag is basically a love letter from a guy living in Massachusetts to the state of New Hampshire, which, in my opinion, is the last free state in the Northeast, um, on the coast, anyways. And uh, it's like a letter letter of encouragement to uh, the people of New Hampshire to hold fast to their motto of "Live free or die," and they really do still. Um, believe that up there. I mean, if they still have freedom up there, when you go up there, it's vastly different than any other state on the Northeast. And I do, t I touch upon greatly uh, firearms uh, in the story. It follows a park ranger working in New Hampshire in, in a search and rescue uh, mission comes across a um, shelter in the woods. And when he goes to investigate the shelter with his partner, uh, what he thinks is like a mobile meth lab turns out to be a homegrown terrorist cell. There's a shootout, and he uncovers um, what eventually will be a false flag that people are trying to perpetrate in New Hampshire. So um, to get back to your point, yes, it's uh, definitely pro-liberty, pro-Second Amendment. It's very firearms-heavy, this novel. I really geeked out on all the gear. I think of all those fun prepping videos that people watch on firearms and knives and all the fun 
fun stuff, I really kind of vicariously stuck all that in the story. Um, the, the, the protagonist, I took some liberties with the park ranger. He carries a, a lever action rifle, a single action army black, uh, Ruger Blackhawk, uh, which is kind of an homage to my love of Westerns. His name is Ransom Donovan, uh, an homage to the man who shot Liberty Valance, one of my uh, favorite Westerns. So it's very pro second amendment to say the least. Yeah, I saw that his name was Ransom. I was wondering if that was a C.S. Lewis nod. No, it was actually a nod to the man who shot Liberty Valance. Uh, um, got it. Jim, Jimmy Stewart, John Wayne's characters were uh, Ransom Stoddard and uh, Tom Donovan, so I kind of blended the two there. Um, and then the the, uh, the park ranger's best friend is his pastor and his brother-in-law, and his name is John Mueller, which is a homage to John Peter Muhlenberg from the Revolutionary War, who was a Black Rope Regiment uh, pastor back during the Revolutionary War. So he's kind of a throwback to that whole era. And one of the themes in the story is the role of pastors in, uh, in the church today and um, why, uh, where have all kind of the real men gone and um, why they seem to have kind of uh, laryngitis you know, due to this vaccine called 5013C, as I like to say. You mentioned Black Robe Regiment. Can you just uh, explain yeah. that for our listeners? A lot of, a lot of folks may sure. not understand the, the role that the pulpit had in this country being formed in the in the first place. And and I think that – I think sure. most people wouldn't. I think it's more than just Mark Dice videos that of, of people that, that have never been educated on that. Can you just uh, tell us real quickly sure. what the Black Regiment the, was? The Black Robe Regiment back during the Revolutionary War was a term that the English – uh, imposed on the uh, the pulpit, the pastors, the clergy, because they were part of the reason why the, the the Americans got stirred up to fight against the British. So they literally saw them as like special ops, and they called them the Black Robe Regiment, and they had like um, prices on their heads. They were considered, you know, enemies of the state, the way any soldier would be, and um, they were yeah, pounding the uh, the pulpits stirring the people up. I mean, John Peter Muhlenberg, a legend has it that he was preaching from Ecclesiastes 3-4, three, uh, three, where a time to live, a time to die, a time to uh, dance. I'm butchering the, the phrase. And then there's a time to fight. And then supposedly after he said fight, he took off his clerical robes, and underneath his clerical robes was a uh, soldier's uniform. And he said that time to fight is now. Walked out of the church, and he signed up like his entire clergy to go fight with George Washington. That's what legend legend says about the character, about that man. But the Black Robe Regiment was basically a direct uh, threat to the uh, to the English. And what's your take on Romans thirteen? Paul says we're we're to submit to the higher powers of government. What's the highest power in America <laughs> in terms of government? Well, the uh, it's it, that's an, another theme in this story is is who is Caesar and who are the authorities? Because many of us believe that the, the authorities would be uh, President Obama, the police, uh, and such. So one of my uh, professors in grad school was Dennis Lehane. He wrote Gone Baby Gone, Mystic River, all those Ben Affleck movies he wrote. And he once said that great art uh, really provides questions rather than answers. Now, I don't necessarily buy into that completely because I'm a Christian. I believe in absolute truth. But I took that concept and I looked at Romans 13 from different angles. Who are the authorities? If Ransom, the protagonist in my story, is a park ranger, he's technically Caesar. But his uh, antagonist in the story is a guy from DHS, Department of Homeland Security. So he's technically Caesar as well. So who is the higher authorities within that context? Uh, Ransom's friend works for the CIA and helps him uncover this false flag. He's technically Caesar as well. So who's in charge out of all those guys that they all have conflicting ideas and values? And um, ultimately, I mean, ultimately, uh, I don't the, – there's a, a fight, and in the end of – from all my research, I found that, in my opinion, the answer was staring at me uh, in the face the entire time. Who is Caesar in America? And – the um, it's ironic because after I finished the book, it just really jumped out at me. 
And the first line of the Constitution says, we the people of the United States. Um, and that, to me, is who Caesar is, who the higher authorities are in this country. And part of the reason why I believe that is prior to the American experience, police, politicians, what have you, were never, ever referred to as civil servants. Only in America were they called civil servants. They work for us. They work for the voters. So the end result, in my opinion, is we are Caesar. That doesn't mean I, I, I'm you know, promoting people to go out and fight or, or take up arms or whatever, but if the Constitution is the ultimate law in the land, so, you know, I'm posing this question within the story. You know, all these characters are in positions of authority, but kind of who's adhering to the Constitution the most? And God, of course. Yeah. My my wife left France to try to escape socialism. Well, that didn't really work out. It's it's I guess she's she's still traded up when you when you look at uh, what's going yeah. on over there. Uh, but I, I think that it's just – it's so global now that there's probably uh, – like Reagan said, this is kind of the last bastion of, of freedom. And once we're gone and we're we're almost gone, but uh, I don't think there's a yeah. whole lot of other places to go. But when she came here and she took her citizenship test, the official answer to that question was the Constitution. Uh, I, I don't know right. if it still is. But at that time, it was you know three or four years, uh, maybe eight years ago, something like six or seven or eight years ago, I guess. And now I've got a copy of that hanging on the wall, and the words you 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 mentioned, "We the people," um, that's larger than any of the other text on the document. Right. Uh, do you think that they were trying to tell us something by writing that? larger or or do you think they were just uh worried they were going to run out of paper if they didn't reduce the size of the letters no i think our founding fathers were geniuses and i think they were trying to tell us that we we just left an oppressive government and we don't want to be uh you know another regime like that and i think it was very clear that they wanted the constitution to be the ultimate law of the land and the people to be in charge. The government should fear the people, not the people fearing the government, which is what's happening today. And this whole thing about these politicians who believe that it's a living document drives me bananas, by the way, on a side note. And the fact that you can amend it. So if you don't like the Second Amendment, have at it. Go try to amend that. And uh, But reinterpreting it and saying it's a living document drives me bananas. And to think that we have Supreme Court justices that actually think like that scares me. And uh, most of my readers really enjoy the fact that I don't use any profanity and that the books don't contain any embarrassing sex scene. Uh, is that safe to say that Mount's, that White Mountain's False Flag is a family-friendly read? It's, it's definitely a family-friendly read. It has um, uh, no swearing, uh, no sex scenes, although I do make, go out of my way to – do one or two scenes where the wife nudges the husband, kind of like wink, wink, um, because I wanted to show clearly uh, that's all that, that they do is just to kind of um, imply, like, uh, the husband at one point says, can anyone hear us up here, honey? And she, and she says something like, no, we're not doing that here. I want to show sex within the, con the context of marriage is a wonderful thing, but there are no sex scenes. There's just one scene or two scenes where the wife kind of nudges the husband and winks. Um, it's very clean. No swearing of pro Christian, pro liberty, um, has strong female characters as well. There's romance in it. Um, there's a, an, ado an adoption process in it as well, and he addresses the whole concept in the Bible about how God has a special place for the fatherless as well. Um, so it's very um, uh, family friendly. Sounds like a really, really good read. Uh, where can folks go to buy the book? It's available currently in the first run. It's ebook only. It's available where all ebooks are sold, uh, or you can go to my website, uh, www.johntheo.com, J O H N T H E O.com. Um, and I also have a YouTube channel under John Theo. Well, John, thanks so much for producing some real good, clean entertainment. And uh, thanks for making time to talk to us today. Mark, thank you so much for having me on, and please keep up the good work.
Trading Post in the Woods is ran by veteran crisis responders who know how important it is to be prepared. They specialize in comprehensive natural survival remedy kits, preparedness and homesteading supplies, as well as skills training. Visit them online today at tradingpostinthewoods.com. Get prepared before disaster strikes. PrepperRecon.com offers molly compatible individual first aid kits for your home, auto, or bug out bag. These kits have everything you need to address a traumatic injury, including an Israeli battle dressing, quick clot, EMT shears, suture kit, steri strips, tourniquet, tough strip bandages, and so much more. $99 includes shipping. Go to PrepperRecon.com and click the store tab at the top of the home page. Order today before it's too late. 